There are many reasons to study art. It can lead to a greater understanding of humanity and an increased ability to really see the world around you, to see the world as an artist might see it. This is not intended to be an art history course. It is a course about how to look at and appreciate art. We will cover some very basic concepts about line, shape, and color. We'll look at the different forms that art might take, drawing, painting, sculpture, photography, and so on. We'll look at art both representational and abstract from many cultures and time periods. We'll offer the background and tools you need so you can learn to see art as an informed viewer. As you look at the works presented throughout this course, you'll learn not only to identify particular works, but to describe their formal elements. You'll begin to think about what the artist was trying to convey. By the end of the course, you'll know much more about looking at art and you'll be able to view it with a critical eye. The elements of art is divided into the following sections, line, shape and mass, texture and pattern, space and perspective, and color and light. These distinctions have been made simply to break down the concepts into simple form for the purposes of discussion. As you read about the different art elements presented here and identify the elements in particular artworks, keep in mind that more than one may be seen in a given artwork, which can make it hard to draw absolute distinctions between some of them. Line easily evolves into shape. Perspective is dependent on line. Texture can be made of any or all the other elements. Color overlaps with everything. The elements are simply the building blocks that artists use. They are all integrated, working together within a work of art. Let's use line to define form, to divide space, to connect objects, to reflect movement, to create shadows and texture, and to direct the viewer's eye. Lines can be hard or soft, narrow or wide, straight or curved, long or short, distinct or blurred. They can be made with any medium. They can be drawn, painted, photographed, chiseled, incised, or woven. Lines serve to draw the viewer into the piece and provide a sense of structure. Line actually can be identified in all of the art elements to be explored in the following sections. A line that connects to itself creates shape and mass. It is an integral part of pattern and texture and it is used to create the illusion of perspective and space on a two-dimensional plane. Line can be used to draw the viewer into the two-dimensional picture plane and to offer visual direction throughout the composition. In a three-dimensional work such as a sculpture, line can lead the viewer around the piece, emphasizing its form and mass. In this ink painting by Shen Zhou, the artist used line to define the mountains, trees, house, and figure as well as to write the poem that is an integral part of the image. The lines are sketchy and gestural, reflecting the actual physical movements of the artist's hands and arms in the process of creating the work. The lines contribute to the integration of image and text, of the mind and the world. This close connection between image and text is an important component in much of Chinese painting. Line plays a vital role in all of Edvard Munch's work. In the scream, line becomes both form and pattern as it is repeated over and over again, building actual texture on the surface of the canvas. The lines of the figure's clothing, of the hands that frame its face, of the bridge, the landscape, and the sky are all alive with movement and energy. They both embody and echo the terror of the screaming figure. Jackson Pollock created lines that dance across the picture plane. He painted Autumn Rhythm number 30 and other major works while standing over and moving around all sides of his canvas as it lay on the floor, dripping and throwing paint with amazing control and finesse. The lines in this work reflect the movement of the artist's arms, his body, and even his wrists as he flicked the paint. The lines describe action, energy, speed, and direction. They vary in length as well as weight. Thick and thin, dark and faint, many of the lines consist of paint drips so thick they have distinct physical depth. Your eyes move across the surface of the canvas as they follow the arrangement of lines. Constructed line. Contemporary artists have explored line in completely new ways, pushing its boundaries visually and inventing new means of creation. In 1953, artist Robert Rauschenberg asked his friend, the composer John Cage, to drive his car through a puddle of black paint 
and then over a long strip of paper, common typing paper that had been glued end to end to form a 20 foot length. The result is automobile tire print with the imprint of the tire along the entire length of paper. Robert Long embraced several different kinds of media in 1967 when he created the piece, A Line Made by Walking. Long walked back and forth across an open field along a single path, creating a straight line of dented grass. The event was photographed, thus creating a piece that crosses the boundaries of drawing, photography, earthwork, art created directly out of the earth, and performance. Eva Hesse's Untitled uses line to explore new boundaries. The constructed fiberglass box has a long rope that is extruded from its center and falls to the floor. In jutting out from the wall into the space of the room and onto the floor, the piece becomes sculpture, inhabiting the same space as the viewer. The line of the rope is alive with potential movement. Shape and Mass Introduction to Shape and Mass A line that joins itself defining an enclosed area delineates a shape. Shapes can also be defined by areas of color or shading. They can be constructed of actual materials as with collage or sculpture. Two-dimensional flat shapes exist on the picture plane. Shapes can appear to be three-dimensional through the illusion of shading, overlapping, or perspective. Actual three-dimensional shapes, known as mass or form, exist in space. A shape, also referred to as a figure or as a positive shape, set against a background creates a figure ground or positive negative relationship. The arrangement of figure and ground are equally important in determining an artistic composition's success. Creating the illusion of mass. A simple sphere is useful in modeling the basic ways light and shading can be used to create form. The highlight at the center of the sphere, reflecting the light directed at that point, brings that part of the object forward, closest to the viewer. The area immediately around it is also well lit. As it moves back from the viewer, the surface of the sphere moves into shadow, with the shadows deepening toward the edges of the object, providing a sharp contrast with the white background. Where the sphere blocks the light, it casts a shadow on the table. All of these variations of dark and light work together to create the illusion of a three-dimensional shape. The same principles can be applied to creating an illusion of mass in any two-dimensional image. This technique of manipulating value to create depth in a two-dimensional artwork is known by the Italian term chiaroscuro. The methods used to create the illusion of mass are very similar to those used to create a sense of space on a picture plane. Both concepts involve the manipulation of light and dark to create contrast, and both also can be employed to create a sense of realism. Keep this discussion of creating the illusion of mass in mind as you read the upcoming section on space and perspective. Uses of shape and mass. Pablo Picasso used shape with great skill and expression. Breaking down body parts into simple shapes he evoked intense emotion and created images explosive with energy. Shape and mass in another culture and time. In this head from the ancient Nok culture, you can see a simplification of shape and mass composed of abstract forms that seem incredibly modern to us today. Look at the similarities in form and shape between this head that dates back to the first century and the works you've just seen by Picasso or Umberto Boccioni. The head has highly stylized facial features and hairstyle, giving it a unique expression. This simplification is characteristic of Nock style, though no one knows anything about how these portraits were used and what their original meaning might have been. Shape as line, sculpture, and symbol. In 1970, the sculptor Robert Smithson created an astonishing earthwork called Spiral Jetty. The piece, built with bulldozers and dump trucks in the shape of a spiral, extends 1,500 feet into the Great Salt Lake in Utah. It is made of mud, salt, crystals, rocks, and water. The spiral form, found in many natural models, is one of the most widespread symbols in the world, having significance in many cultures. 
In this particular work, it has come to symbolize life and death, motion and stability, expansion and contraction. Over time, the jetty has changed considerably. The earth and rocks are now covered with white salt crystals, making the jetty look almost like a mirage rather than a construction of dirt and rock. It is sometimes completely underwater, but then slowly emerges as water levels shift. Shape and mass as negative space. The space between shapes is known as negative space or background. It can be as important to a piece of art as the foreground shapes. In this painting by Matisse, both the primary shapes and the negative shapes are essential to the formal structure of the image. Space and perspective. Introduction to space and perspective. Using only the contrast between light and dark, artists can create pattern, texture, depth, and form. They use light to make some objects appear to come forward on the picture plane, and they use shadow to make others recede. They can create the illusion of space, making the entire picture plane appear to be three-dimensional, an illusion of reality. Techniques such as layering, manipulating contrast, and adjusting the apparent size of objects can create the impression of space. Artists also use a mathematical system known as perspective to create the illusion of space, making objects appear smaller as space recedes. Creating a sense of space. In the section on shape and mass, you learned about creating the illusion of three-dimensional space on an object, thus turning a flat object into one with the illusion of mass. That same theory works across the entire picture plane. Artists create a sense of space and depth by changing the size of an object depending on where it sits on the picture plane. Large objects generally appear to be closer than smaller objects. For example, in reality a footstool is usually smaller than a chair, but the artist may make the stool much larger so that it appears to be closer. A house might seem to be its proper size in relationship to a figure in the foreground, or it could be rendered very small and therefore perceived to be situated in the distant background. By layering or placing objects or figures behind one another, artists also can convey the illusion of space. In a cluster of bottles sitting on a table, some will be placed behind the others, thus establishing a sense of space in a room. Likewise, to make a part of an image appear to be closer to the viewer, the depth perspective of objects and figures can be intentionally contracted using a technique known as foreshortening. Texture and Pattern Introduction to Texture and Pattern Texture and pattern can be physical, actual material used to build up a tactile surface, or illusionary, the appearance of texture created with shadow, line, or color. Pattern can be made of any of the formal elements we've discussed thus far, whether line, shape, color, or texture. These elements create patterns when used in repetition. You can find pattern everywhere in the world around you, in architecture, textiles, furniture, and nature. Pattern and texture have played a role in the arts in just about every culture throughout time. Identifying pattern. The tile mosaic, mihrab, pictured here incorporates many different patterns and textures. How many of each can you distinguish? Color and light. Introduction. People often respond strongly to the color in a work of art. It generally evokes an immediate emotional response. Interestingly, Color theory is actually quite scientific and measurable, more so than other elements of art. It's important to understand just how color is created and how it can be manipulated and controlled to achieve very specific results. Pigment and light have different attributes and therefore are used in different ways. Understanding these differences will help you appreciate the sensitivities and skills needed to use color effectively. Color in pigment. Pigment color is physical. It is comprised of paint, ink, pencil, dye, or the actual colors of the materials used. It is defined in terms of three attributes, hue, for example, red, orange, yellow, green, 
blue or purple, lightness or value, light versus dark, saturation, intense versus dull. The three primary colors, red, blue, and yellow, are defined as such because they cannot be obtained by mixing other colors. Secondary colors are made by mixing two primary colors. For example, blue and yellow together make green, red and yellow mixed make orange. The reference to a specific color on the color wheel is called its hue. If all the pigment colors were mixed together, in theory, they would create black. Hence, the mixing of pigment colors is referred to as a subtractive process. A color's value is determined by the amount of black or white it includes. In the 20th century, artists began to use light as a medium unto itself. In 1961, Dan Flavin broke new ground in the use of light as a medium for art, using commercially available fluorescent light fixtures in his creations. He continued to use fluorescent bulbs in endless variations throughout his career. In his works, the color of light defines the lines of the actual piece, but also moves beyond it into the room, impacting the immediate environment. The light becomes quite powerful and encompassing, filling the space in which the viewer stands. Seeing Flavin's work in person is quite different from looking at photographs of the pieces. The work of the artist Nam Jun Pike developed out of his interest in politics and the growing commercial culture embraced and symbolized by television. He saw television, the moving image, and electronics as metaphors for our society today, and he has incorporated them into his artworks. The light emitted from his monitors, light fixtures, and other electronic devices in Electronic Superhighway, Continental US, creates a dazzling pattern that continuously moves across the pieces. The lights evoke the energy, evocative of the fields of communication and the progress that he's trying to convey. As with the works described by other artists who use light, such as Dan Flavin and James Turrell, Pike's work is best understood when seen in person when you can see the lights flickering and moving before your eyes. Color in light. Color in light works somewhat differently from the way it works in pigment. The primary colors of light are red-orange, green, and blue-violet. The secondary colors are yellow, magenta, and cyan. If you mix all the colors of light together, the result is white light. Hence, the mixing of color in light is called an additive process. Design. Almost everything you see around you was designed by an artist. Your desk, chair, computer, clothes, books, even your pen. Design generally falls into two categories. Two-dimensional design, or graphics, includes posters, advertisements, books and magazines, logos, and typography. It can also include web design. Three-dimensional design, often referred to as industrial design, includes any kind of three-dimensional mass-produced object. The study of both two- and three-dimensional design has become more complex in recent years. Most design work is now done with computers rather than by hand. As electronic technology has become commonplace in our lives, the design world has embraced it with the same vigor it embraced earlier technologies. Color in light. Color in light works somewhat differently from the way it works in pigment. The primary colors of light are red-orange, green, and blue-violet. The secondary colors are yellow, magenta, and cyan. If you mix all the colors of light together, the result is white light. Hence, the mixing of color and light is called an additive process. <laughs> 